Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasha. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Rockstar Chronicle Series 1, my new book featuring over 45 intimate conversations with the greatest legends the world will ever know. Available now at bookbaby.com and amazon.com. Prague Rock Giants, Merlion, are currently on the road with the Light at the End of the Tunnel Tour in the UK, which will be followed by several Merlion weekends until summer 2022 and a major European tour in autumn 2022. Steve Rothery is the original guitarist and the longest continuous member of the British rock band Merlion. Rothery appears on every Marillion release since their 1982 debut single. Outside Marillion, Rothery has recorded two albums as part of the duo The Wishing Tree and an instrumental solo album, The Ghost of Pripyat, released in September of 2014. He also founded the British Guitar Academy in 2011. He also performs with his own band, the Steve Rothery Band. Marillion's 20th studio album, An Hour Before It's Dark, will be released via Ear Music on March 4th of this year. And let me tell you, it's incredible. Please welcome legendary guitarist, songwriter with progressive rock giants Marillion, Steve Rothery, to Interviewing the Legends. Hello, Steve. Hi, Ray. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, man. Are you still walking 5K a day? <laughs> um, I haven't been the last um, few weeks. It's been so cold here. But yeah, I mean, I, go, I have an exercise bike as well. So, you know, you, you try and do what you can, don't you? Try and recover from Christmas, whatever. <laughs> exactly. You know, me and you are about the same age. I'm my birthday was yesterday. I just turned 63. Uh -huh. Oh, excellent. Right. Yeah. So I guess we would have been in high school together. That, that, that's, that's, yeah. 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 That's pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, 43 years this year since uh, I joined Marine. Isn't that amazing? How time yeah. flies, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. It's a lifetime. It's several <laughs> lifetimes. <laughs> First of all, an hour before it start, what a great title, you know? And, you know, it reminds me of when you were a kid, you know, it's uh, you better be home an hour before dark, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, it's um, yeah, no, it, it, it encapsulates the, the kind of the feeling of of, uh, of the world, really, I think, at, at, at the moment. And uh, yeah, it's written and recorded during a pandemic. So, you know, it kind of uh, surfaces in the in the lyrics. Uh, and to a certain extent in the music at various times, you know, it's been the strangest of journeys, I suppose. Well, I'll tell you one thing, it's it's gotten a lot of great musicians in the studio and recording a lot of great music and coming up with a lot of, you know, inspirational lyrics. So uh, I guess there are positive things to it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, it maybe took a few months longer than it would, would have done because there's, there were times when um the band worked without me for a, a few weeks because i was uh shielding and and then there was a time when we couldn't work together at all because everything was locked down over here mm. for, for a few months uh but then when when we did get together i think there was a great energy you know it's kind of I don't know. It it focuses you. It makes you realize when you've been denied something for for quite a while. When you all get together and and you can do what it is that makes you special, um, that's that's when when the kind of the magic happens. Yeah, when you were tired of being on the road all those years, now you're ready to get back on the road again. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it'll ever be like it was. I mean, 2019 was a nuts year for me. You yeah. know, around the world both with Marillion with my solo band right um and then you know for all that to stop and and we we did the the, the UK tour in in November of last year and that that was mm -hmm. the first time we've been on stage together in nearly two years uh and when you've been doing this all your life that's a strange feeling yeah well I gave this album five stars by the way uh I loved it thank you um you got the first single was released be hard on yourself and February 4th, you got the second single, Murder Machines, coming out. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. There's a, an edited version going to radio. And uh, yeah, it's it's quite a, a, a hooky, guitar-driven song. A couple of, couple of great riffs. 
there's probably a, a, a more heavy guitars on this record than there has mm -hmm. been in the past, just the way that we approached it. Um, and, you know, a lot of credit to, to Mike Hunter, the producer, really, because he, um, not only is he like the mediator whenever there's any disagreement over direction, but he's just great at capturing those little moments and, and putting them into the arrangements of the song. So there's loads of really cool little guitar hooks and melodies that sure. he's, he's managed to slot in with nearly all of these tracks. So, uh, of course, the challenge now is that I have to learn all these, which is what I've been <laughs> doing this last <laughs> yeah. week uh, with a laptop, you know, kind of listen to it literally a hundred times to try and and and, uh, and burn everything in, which doesn't get easier the older you get. <laughs> I know, I know. Would you consider this a concept album, basically, or what do you think? It's it's linked. I think it has um, the common the common threads on mm -hmm. certain songs. It wouldn't. It's it's not really a concept album in the same way that Brave was, um, but it definitely has. You know, although Steve set out not to write about the pandemic, when you kind of living through such a historical um, period of time, it can't help but. You know, permeate what you do in some way and I think you know he's had to write about it because that's what's happening in his life and that's tends to be how he he writes and how he wants to express himself the same way with the whole um you know global warming thing um you know that's just things that you you have to try and express I love how the album is broken down in in parts or pieces you know you, you have the main headline like be hard on yourself then you have uh the tear in the big picture uh less for luxury you can learn i just love how it's broken down that way it's it's it is so cool you know yeah and no, i think it, it it makes it uh interesting to do that also mm -hmm. it's just the way because so much music is consumed by streaming these mm -hmm. days uh it, that you have to try and maximize the very limited income that one tends to earn from streaming these days, which exactly. is one of the reasons you, you tend to subdivide the songs like that. Some of my favorite tracks, and yes, the guitar is beautiful on a lot of these songs. And anytime we can get more guitar licks from you, it's it's a it's a great thing. Uh, I first noticed you, I guess, on a cure for us, had some great guitar work. Yes, yeah. Um, for me, uh, probably Crow and the Nightingale and, and Care, the end of Care are the two moments mm -hmm. on the album where I think everything just kind of comes together. I mean, it's not only the guitar, but it's like, you know, using the choirs for the first time. Right. Adds this really emotional uh, richness. Um, because some of these things you don't really get to hear during the making of the record. It's like, it's quite late in the day when somebody had the idea of using this choir because the guy who shoots our videos had, had shot a video at the Royal Albert Hall with Bring Me the Horizon uh, using this choir. And he suggested it when we're down at Real World doing some recording and, and shooting the documentary for the, for the album down there. Uh, and then when I heard what what Kat, what the, the, the girl who did the arrangements and the main singer had done, it just kind of completely blew me away because it sounded great anyway, but then it just elevates it to a whole different level. You know, when you have that happening, sure. and then you have the guitar cell coming in and it's, yeah, it's uh, very emotional. It's a very deep and an emotional record, and but it's got the upbeat as well and positive aspects to it. Oh, definitely, you know? yeah. Yeah, but I, it, it, the message is, is incredible, you know. Well, I think music is is such an uplifting, positive thing for, for most sure. people anyway. It's what, one of the things that gets you through the day. You know, to have that kind of release and that journey and, and to be able to immerse yourself and forget everything else that's happening in the world sometimes. Um, so I think it's it's definitely a very positive thing. Well, music is what's going to bring peace in the world. That's what I always think. <laughs> yeah, well, it, <laughs> it's, it's something, it's a universal language. It is. Uh, and it is, uh, it's got beauty and it's got truth uh, in yep. it. Um, and depending on the song, it's not usually political or, or right. But you know, it, it has that. I just have a, a strange power to you, unite people, and you see that when we um, do the Meridian weekends. You know, we do mm -hmm. one in, in the Netherlands, in Port Zeeland, and we have three thousand people that travel from every corner of the world mm -hmm. 
to, to, to come and watch us play. Uh, and it's just the energy and the friendships that, that, you know, this bond of music brings people together in this, in this incredibly powerful way. Murder Machines has an interesting guitar sound in the beginning of it. And then he gets into a, explain that. Um, well, on the whole of this record, really, I, I try to do something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, most things have kind of been done. So, you know, you have the classic sounds and you just try and find new, new little variations sometimes. Um, so it's like maybe it's a combination of using certain pedals together. Like there's a, a, a mojo vibe, which is quite an old fashioned, I think Hendrix used to use one kind of modulation mm -hmm. uh, pedal, but, but I use it with a um, electro harmonics uh, pitchfork, which is like an octave box. Uh, and I use it post the the distortion from the preamp of the of the guitar amp. So it, all these things together kind of gives it a, quite a different sort of tone that you wouldn't really hear. And I use that quite a lot uh, all over the album, and maybe tremolo as well. That's um, something that I think uh, has a a timeless aspect to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm probably the <laughs> most closely. Uh, associated with the whole chorus sound of the 80s because I did use that a lot on a, a lot of the Marillion um, catalogue but I've kind of tried to move away from that really and I use yeah use things like the Mojo Vibe or, or the Rotosphere which is like a Leslie pedal mm -hmm. uh, occasionally in the last few albums um, but yeah you just try and find something that suits the song you know right the great thing about using guitars and using pedals is it becomes almost like a different instrument. It's how you approach playing the sort of part that works changes depending on the sound of the guitar. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's, yeah, it's a great creative tool to inspire you. The scary thing, I've talked to a lot of electric violinists and that sounds so much like an electric guitar now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. They, yeah. they can do a lot of the same stuff, but I think... The guitar is even now it's just such a miraculous instrument there's there's so many things you can find in it mm -hmm. um just kind of melodies within chords and 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 you don't even have to approach it in, in a in a technical way to to really get something special out of it um, yeah but for me playing has always been about bending and vibrato and, and and that kind of melodic aspect to playing all my favorite players like, you know, like Dave Gilmore and Steve Hackett and Andy Latimer mm -hmm. all had this kind of emotional kind of quality to their playing. I know Steve, uh, me and Steve have, we've done a ton of interviews together. And I, matter of fact, we, I just talked to Steve not too long ago while he was on tour and uh, he was between shows and he was kind of all ruffled on camera and you know, he was apologizing right. for that. Yeah, no, I, I know Steve well. He's he's a, he's a great friend of mine. We go out for dinner quite often. Him and his wife Joe, and me and my wife Joe. Yeah. In fact, we're going out next week again. Oh, uh, cool! Tell him I said hi. I will do. Yeah, he. Yeah. he I went to see Cirque du Soleil in London a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago, and I, I had a box uh, there, and, and he, he, him, and Joe were, were my guests at Cirque du Soleil. So that was. Uh, do you know uh, Nad? Also, Nad Sylvain. Yeah, I've met him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's I, a funny I, guy. Yeah, <laughs> had, had Jack Jackson and, and uh, Nick Beggs in the box as well. So um, it was it was, it was a, a prog rock royalty box. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. I love prog rock, man. I go way back, you know. And you you mentioned Andy from Camel. You know that guy's he he's another god to me. I love Camel. You know, and David Gilmore, of course. Yeah. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to do a, a masterclass and lecture at a, an international conference of progressive rock in, in Spain next month. Oh, cool. So, really? So, uh, I'll have to try and talk some sense. Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of explain my personal journey and what, what uh, prog rock means to me, I think. You know, the Brits should be very proud of that. You know, you guys, the, the way we brought the blues, you know, in America, you guys brought prog rock. You know, and you should be very proud of that. Yeah, it's it's a strange thing, really, because you know there's still the blues within prog a lot of the time, but there's also some classical music, some English folk yeah. music. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it's just is a really weird melting pot of of influences. That, but for me, prog rock is just 
music that doesn't have to confine to standard structures, you know. Yeah. Uh, exactly. You, you just have the freedom to do whatever you like. You don't have to yep. verse, chorus, etc. It's uh, it's a very liberating form to work in in, in that respect. Yeah, but you guys definitely invented it. I mean, I know there might be elements of you know uh, blues or or whatever in there, but it's all English. In my opinion, yeah, I suppose you know? there's a, a big chunk of it. Yeah, there's a certain. Yeah. I think that that's probably the folk aspect that that uh, that came through in the early days, or or, or maybe some uh, classical. You know, and people like Tony Banks and such mm -hmm. a phenomenal writer and musician. Um, and then obviously Steve's work in in uh, in the Genesis days is just mm -hmm. uh, outstanding, really. Going back to the album, "The Crow and the Nightingale," it might be my favorite uh, track. And your guitars sound very Gilmore on that. <laughs> uh, it is. It's probably my favorite track, actually. Um, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, Gilmore is always going to be an influence because um, it's a kind of the bluesiness that I, I kind of like, right? Um, and really, it's it's kind of what the music's doing is def defines how much of that comes through. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that and and some of the solos on on Care, I, I, I recorded at my studio at home. Um, I say at home; it's in my garage, but it's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a fully equipped, equipped Pro Tools studio with uh, more guitar gear than most music shops. So it's it's not your standard garage, you know. <laughs> All the great bands started in a garage, okay? Yeah. So you're, you're doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done a lot of work there over the years. The, the, yeah, <laughs> made the various bits of Meridian albums I, I've kind of recorded there over the years. Very cool. Uh, Sierra Leone, I guess, uh, which morphs into Chance in a Million, The White Sand, The Diamond, The Blue Warm Air. All, they're all beautiful tracks more than a treasure which also has one of my favorite cool guitars on that track as well on more than a treasure yeah that's the song that i've been learning um for the last couple of days actually and mm -hmm. uh again it's just there's so many little melodic moments uh, mm -hmm. and you try and hold them in your brain uh to learn them uh, yeah it's it's a challenge uh but uh, i'm getting there <laughs> hey i can't wait to see you play all these tracks in, in concert. That'd be great. Yeah, we're going to do them for the first time at the Meridian Weekend. So we have the first one of good. those in, good, good, in good. Wuch in, in Poland at the beginning of April. Okay, yeah. Hey, don't forget about the U.S. now, and not, not just the cruise. I mean... No, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're doing, yeah, we're doing Canada. I mean, I know it's not the U.S., but, you know, we, we are doing uh, Montreal again. Um and I wanted to do a convention at Vegas many years ago. That would be cool. Yeah. Um, I'd go to that. I think the, pro the problem is things are a lot more complicated for us to 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 do this sort of thing in the States or mm -hmm. even to tour in the States, just in terms of the visa situation and the expense of that, the uh, yeah. withholding tax. You know, it, it's, it is a, they don't make it easy for you, put it that way. You know, it's such a sh uh, shame. There's a lot of great bands that don't come to the States anymore. You know, I, I know the guys from Golden Earring. They don't come to the States anymore. They used to a long time ago. Yeah. I'm interviewing Susie Quattro coming up. She hardly comes to the States. Yeah. Status quo never came to the States. I mean, they did back in the day, but they yeah. won't, you know, they don't come anymore. And it's kind of sad because you, you miss seeing these guys, you know? Yeah. Um, well, maybe it will get easier in the future. But, yeah, I mean, it's hard to see really in what way it could because obviously that if that wasn't complicated enough, there's been the whole pandemic situation which has made uh, doing anything very difficult. Uh, right. Yeah, you know, we did this UK tour, but uh, Mark uh, Kelly, our keyboard player, got COVID 10 days before it started. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, it was a question mark whether or not we could do the tour, whether or not he mm -hmm. was going to be well enough in time to do the tour. Um, so it's it's just another factor that makes touring complicated. I'm not sure that it will ever get back to how it was. I don't uh, think before. so. I think you're uh, right. if it does, it will it will, it will be in five years' time. Um, uh, yeah, at the moment it feels like this is like a, this is a new chapter. You know, this is the new normal. 
you have to kind of try and deal with this. I mean, mm-hmm. just getting on a cruise, quite honestly, is a little bit scary. It is. <laughs> because, uh, yeah. you know, if there's an outbreak, then most of the people on that boat are going to get it. Yeah, that's true. And a lot of ships now are only half full because exactly yeah. what you say. You know, they're afraid to travel on a ship. I like the way the album finishes. It's a great ending. I mean, mm. um, you get um, care, which is, you know, it, it just fits perfectly for the ending of the, of the, 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 and the message you guys are trying to bring to this. It's, oh, it's, it's uh, incredible. Yeah. You know, you got care, right. maintenance, drugs, an hour before dark, which is an incredible track. I hope you release that as well on video. That'd be great. Maybe down the road. Yeah. No, it's it is a, it's a very visual album in, in a lot of ways. Yes, so. it is very visual, and I think the end of care is one it is one of the most beautiful and moving thing, things we've done. I think Steve's lyric at the very end there. I think you're right. Um, you know, you've had had the solo, you've had the other the, the, the celestial choirs, right? And then just the the very end is you know it brings a tear to my eye, and you it know, does I'm part of it. So uh, it would be very interesting to see what, what people make of it when it comes out. So that's been the really strange thing about this record is that we've we've made it and then it, it's had to sit on the shelf for five months, which yeah. is, we've never that's, had that experience before. And it's quite bizarre and it's a little bit upsetting, but yeah. that's just the, the, the situation we're in. There's apparently there's a worldwide cardboard shortage. It's about a four month queue Jeez. to get anything <laughs> pressed on vinyl these days. Right. Um, and you know, this is the, the lead time you need to give the record company for them to, to do a proper release. So uh, it's nuts. It's an interesting cover as well, isn't it? It the, is. The yeah. Colors. Yeah. Yeah, no, the like whole that. clock and, and, and the earth. and yeah, yeah, no, that was my, we had various images to choose from, uh, mm-hmm. and I was quite adamant that that had to be the, the one we used because uh, it just, I think it, it's a it's a perfect thing. It's kind of modern. Uh, it's a striking graphic. It means something. Um, yeah. It's you know, I, those- I, this might be the most important album you guys ever put out. And the, the ending, like you said, is, is surreal. It, Angels on Earth, you, that's the last track yeah. on the album. What a finish. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful track. I loved it. I, ca- I can't imagine another band on the planet making this album, um, especially not in this situation. So, yeah, I think we've done really well to, to, to pull it off. Well, I want to talk about uh, some other things. Uh, your album, is it the Revon to Let album? Yeah, we haven't too late. It's yeah, it's it's still a work in progress because I've been pretty much the ruling arm took over in terms of give, giving it all my creative energies. Um, it's I've got three three of the songs completely finished, three okay. kind of half finished. There's a track that's probably going to be coming out soon because it's going to be used by uh, a, a big German uh, hi-fi show. Uh, called the high-end show it's a mm-hmm. track called x15 right which also features a guest appearance by steve hackett oh cool uh, and that's a really really cool track uh very very different to, to anything else uh but it actually comes from a session that i did um during the uh mixing and recording of the brave album mm-hmm. uh, of, of, of in liverpool uh, uh, a past street uh, with uh pete on bass and uh my my great friend Paul Craddock who mm-hmm. who was at that time the drummer in a band called Enchant um uh and also played with me in the wishing tree um and so it's it, it was the three of us did this session during uh that time <clears throat> which I then gone back to and edited and and, and added keyboards to and like Steve Hackett and etc and it's yeah it's turned out incredibly well so that I'm, I'm very excited for people to hear that now this is a space theme instrumental album, correct? Yes, yeah. It's, I've always been fascinated by space and astronomy. Uh, I've, I've been lucky enough to go down to the uh, uh, ESO um, European Southern Observatories down in Chile several times. Uh, I was Very down cool. there in the summer of uh, um, of 2019. Or we played a live concert at La Silla Observatory. Um, to coincide with this full solar eclipse down there. And we shot a lot of videos of the live performance and, and stuff with drones. And uh, that will be, a, there'll be like a bonus um, DVD or Blu-ray with the uh, the album when it comes out that will feature a lot of that stuff. 
This is a also a crowdfunding campaign, right? Yeah, I'll probably launch a crowdfunding campaign once I finish writing it. I thought okay, I think it might be a bit, a bit premature <laughs> to do it before. <laughs> especially since it's taken me uh, quite a lot longer than I anticipated so but yeah, uh, it, the tracks I've got finished I'm really happy with it's it's very different uh, maybe to the Ghost of Pripyat because it's less of a band feel on the whole uh, but it's yeah it's it's cool it's a it's a, a great thing to be, to be doing I'm also doing some work uh, with Steve Hackett we've been working together on a project for several years now mm -hmm. uh, but eventually we'll get the time to to, to move that forward I'm doing some work uh, with Thorsten from Tangerine Dream. Uh, oh, wow. On a, on a project. We uh, Very cool. Had a couple of sessions uh, of that one, one in Berlin and one at the Marillion studio. Uh, and we kind of been working remotely in that because I was supposed to go to Berlin uh, last month, but because of the whole pandemic situation, uh, I had to postpone it. But uh, yeah, so we're working remotely on that. So. Uh, you know, I like to have a lot of plates spinning. That's that's my thing. Uh, I, I hate to be bored. <laughs> well, you got plenty going on, man. I'm yeah. Telling you. <laughs> yeah, and also I'm gonna, I'll do the second volume of my my photo diaries, my postcards from the road at some point, uh, and another another uh, album with my band, the Steve Rothery band as well. That's that's also on the cards. So. You did a live a live album with with your band a while ago. Yeah, right? live. Uh, yeah, yeah. released on on, on Blu-ray, which has gone down incredibly well. Um, so yeah, I'm supposed to be doing some more shows with them over over the Easter weekend in, in Europe, uh, the pandemic permitting. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, that's great fun. I mean, you know, we, we we play the ghosts of Pripyat, and we also play a lot of the old Marillion stuff that we don't play any longer in in Marillion, You know, and I was kind of the main writer for a lot of that music, so I, it's great for me to still be able to go out and play those songs. <clears throat> I did the whole of this place, child. Did the whole of Clutching at Straws, and yeah, it's, it's fun to do. I like I like to see you do a solo album like David Gilmore's first solo album, which is one of my favorite. Right. You know, just, you know, all you all guitar. Yeah. Uh, what's pretty cool on YouTube, they have you doing solo part one, part two that I guess they pick all the parts of you doing solo. It's yeah, there's a very few clever. Of those a few of those videos. Yeah. From, yeah. On YouTube. Some of them from uh, Marillion Weekends, where they've just put all the solo sections. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's fun to do. I mean, the Ghost of Pripyat's gone down incredibly well, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, people just want to hear me play the guitar, which is which exactly is a, it's a nice thing. You know, I kind of approach it almost like a voice anyway, in terms of trying to play melodies and trying to kind of create a sort of narrative, um, you know, like an imaginary film soundtrack. Really, mm -hmm. is how I tend to approach it. Well, you're you're a natural like David Gilmore. You know, you just kind of you do it. You know, there's it's, it looks like no yeah. thinking involved. It just comes out. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of yeah, it's a sort of communication, I suppose, really. And, and you could argue that I express myself more eloquently in, in music than in words. Uh, I think you know when you give your life to music, um, sometimes it makes you slightly dysfunctional as a human being. <laughs> You know, I'm not the most practical person in the world. You know, I have my, I play the guitar well. I'm, I'm pretty good at photography, uh, but my my DIY skills, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I keep on trying to do it, and it all goes horribly wrong. So I've kind of learned to uh, get get someone in who really knows what they do. Do you practice much on guitar, or what do you think? Um, it depends. Sometimes I do. Uh, okay. But quite often, I'd, I'd much prefer to to write than necessarily practice scales. Because the way mm -hmm. my, my styles evolve anyway, it's it's almost like a little, uh, a different branch of the evolutionary tree. It's, um, you know, my hand position, my whole technique is such that I'm, I'm never going to be a shredder. I don't, that's not what excites me about the guitar. So what... I tend to try and develop my imagination more than my technique, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I like the idea of trying to come up with something fresh and new and interesting because, you know, there's, there's millions of guitarists all around the world right. playing exactly the same leads. <laughs> True. You know, yeah. uh, and there are still interesting or fresh things you can do on the guitar if you have the imagination 
to just to try and break out of that. I like the guys that are uh, eclectic, can play just about anything, you know. Uh, one guy I think that's in my top three top guitarists is definitely Steve Howe. And, you know, anybody that can play acoustic, electric, and, you know, can just about play anything, you know. They, yeah. Actually, Richie Blackmore is like that. I had Candace, his wife, on not long ago, and Richie really plays great acoustic guitar, especially when he got into uh, Blackmore's Night. Yeah. You know? So uh, I admire that a lot. You no, know? absolutely. It's quite often you have players who are great at one discipline, but um, yeah. that's that's it. But, uh, yeah, there are some... And, and also those musicians that can play multiple instruments, you know, the some mm -hmm. these guys, amazing drummers, play keyboards, play the guitar. It's just like, yeah, like, give me a break, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you, you know, George Harrison never practiced, and he admits he could have been a much better guitar player if you practice. Well, George was a phenomenal player. I think anyone who's ever tried to learn his parts can mm -hmm. tell you that. Uh, again, quite quirky, and, and probably my my earliest influence uh, is his sort of approach. Um, but yeah, I, I love his playing. Again, that thing about playing what's right for the song, you know, it's mm -hmm. not about your ego. It's like you just do, do what the song needs. That's exactly right. I want to mention another Marillion album uh, that's excellent, um, and I definitely want to uh, promote it's with friends at St. David's. Um, yes, that's that's another good album, but yeah, it was just released not long ago as well. Yes, I, I, I work with the with the quartet and the wind players. It's just, uh, yeah, really interesting that the, the different dimension they can add to the to the older songs. I think Mike Hunter's arrangements are stunning, and I think for me. A quartet and, and I could say two wind players mm -hmm. works works better than an orchestra, a full orchestra would work. So that could overpower it. And what we do within our the way we all play together anyway is quite orchestral in terms of the the arrangements and the sort of sounds we use. So you don't need that whole 50 piece orchestra happening at the same time, really. Right. So what's your favorite guitar now of choice? What what are you playing? What what's your uh Go to uh, instrument. My my, I've I've got a um a, a blade Stratocaster, an R H four from mm -hmm. uh, one of the first ones that was made. I think end of the seventies, okay. beginning of the eighties, and that's my main guitar and has been since uh, nineteen ninety nine. Um, so I, I use that. But I've got various other guitars. I've got um the one I use on my solo stuff is a uh, made by a guy called Jack Dent mm -hmm. down in. Uh, just outside of Winston Salem in, in uh, North really? Carolina, and uh, yeah, that's a, a great guitar. Uh, and he's he's made a few for me that I, I I've used a lot over the years on different albums. Um, yeah, lovely guy and a real craftsman. I think he's actually retired from making guitars now, but uh, but yeah, really really beautiful instruments. Um, then yeah, I've got several blades, several strats. Um, my most interesting guitar, I suppose. I've got a, a guitar that was made by Steinberger for me uh, back at the beginning of the 90s. It's the mm -hmm. only one in the world. It's a double neck guitar, um, six and 12, but it's all both necks are three single coil pickups. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all the others that made were like two singles on a humbucker. So this is the only one, as far as I know, that was ever made uh, in this uh, format. So it's it's probably by far and away the most valuable guitar that I own. Oh, beautiful. I, uh, I I play guitar and I've had several wrist surgeries, so I can't play a heavy guitar anymore because I it, it, you know I'm, I'm kind of disabled a little bit because of my right. wrist. So I usually just play like tellies, you know, because right. they're, they're pretty lightweight. Is there anything lighter than a telly that I could use? I'm in the market for a guitar, by the way. <laughs> um, you got one you want to sell? <laughs> well, that's some of Jack's guitars are surprisingly light, actually. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but I mean, the, the one I've got, uh, probably the lightest guitar is like an acoustic right. uh, tele kind of uh, guitar that I used live for the first time in November. There uh, is a Telesonic, I think it's the Defender one, but that, mm -hmm. that's a pretty cool guitar. But yeah, no, I, I know what it's like. I mean, I've been suffering for a, with a frozen shoulder that's only Ooh. just starting to get better for the kind of life over, over a year, yeah, which made playing and even practicing painful for quite a long time. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> Steve, here, here's a question I ask everybody and I get some very interesting answers. If you had a field of dreams, wish like the movie to perform, collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? Oh, I'd say probably Joni Mitchell. Joni Mitchell, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love a lot of Joni's work, especially I suppose her earlier work. Right. Uh, you know, when when it all got too jazzy, she kind of lost me a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think she's an outstanding artist. Um, Neil Finn from Crowded House would be another one. Mm -hmm. um, Kate Bush uh, would be another. So yeah, there's, there's a handful of, of uh, great artists that would be great to to play with. How about Hendrix? <laughs> oh, I just I just want to stand there watching play. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, even get on the same stage. That's I'd funny. Take photos. That's what Robin Trower told me. I said, how about yeah. Hendrix? He says, no, I'd be too embarrassed to play with Hendrix. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he, funny. He, he was, yeah, he, he was a time traveler from the future. That's what that's yeah. why. Yeah. Hey, um, Robin Trower told me James Brown. That was his answer. And believe it or not, Petula Clark told me Pink Floyd. She liked to play with Pink Floyd. Isn't that something? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I get some really interesting answers. That's why I always ask, ask, ask that question. Steve, I want to thank you. Is there anything else you need to promote? Uh, I don't think so. No. <laughs> um, you can, people can subscribe to a mailing list on my website, stevebrothery.com, if they want to uh, find out what's happening and when my albums uh, eventually come out, it's a bit like the space album, Revan Too Loud. Um, so, yeah, anyone interested? There's some clips um, from the live Blu-ray live in London on, on YouTube if people want to check that out. Excellent. Yeah, I'm looking forward to your solo album because, you know, space, Prague, I mean, come on, that's everything. Yeah. Man. That's, that's all, yeah. as good that's as all I gets. care about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to mention, purchase the latest release by Marillion, An Hour Before Dark, and that's available uh, in March. Uh, what's the date again? I don't, March. Beginning of March sometime. Yeah, right. I, uh, For, I lose track. I know. I just lost track. I, I said it earlier in the intro, but it's it's the beginning of March. Um, the, the second single is going to be coming out the beginning of February, and it'll be available. I mean, you can go to Merillion.com. I think you got Merillion.earmusic.net. You can go there, and it's going to be available on Amazon.com as well. So everybody will be able to get it. It's a fantastic album. I think one of the best Marillion albums ever put out. Very deep. Uh, love it. Very emotional. And it's also upbeat with positive, uh, positive aspects of it. And it, I give it five stars. It's a, it's a fantastic album. I can listen to it over and over and over again. I love it. Steve, thank you so much, man, for being on the show today. My pleasure. Uh, cheers. You know, take care of yourself. Take care of the family. Say hello to Steve Hackett for me. Will do. And come to America when you get a chance. <laughs> we will. One day we will return. <laughs> we shall return. Yes. <laughs> we'll see uh, you, Steve. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye.